team. Well, good morning, everyone, again. Um, what a fun Sunday, right? Just to, what a rich time of worship. Thank you, worship team, again, just for leading us uh, into a time of just really f- centering um, our minds and our hearts on, on God. And great to, to see the warm welcome for Emily. So that's really exciting. When we gather on Sundays, uh, our purpose is to create a space where people can, can really reflect on their life with God, can grow in their life with God in soul, community, and mission. And so if you're visiting with us today, uh, you're our guest, I'm just really grateful you're here. Um, yeah, let's take a moment to pray and ask God to um, say what he wants to say to us today. And God, thanks a lot for this just uh, a beautiful day, uh, a beautiful day to gather with uh, your people, to celebrate uh, new members, to celebrate and uh, worship you. Um, and to hear um, what you might want to say to us about our lives. Um, thank you that you care, God. You care about the, the small and big details of our lives. And I pray that you would give us just an openness to, and a sensitivity to know that you are here with us and that you desire to speak. So I pray that you would speak through me and that we would listen to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, in the mid-1990s, Uh, I was thinking about this. I was like, oh, man, there's probably some people here who weren't even born then, which makes me sad, but that's okay. That means our church is growing and we have new people. But there was a beverage company that launched a national campaign that went like this. Image is nothing. Thirst is everything. Obey your thirst. So it was considered a smashing success, at least by marketing standards, Uh, And given the fact that some of you guys were able, you guys, like, I saw you nodding, you know what I'm talking about, right? This was Sprite's uh, campaign that went out. Uh, And uh, so the question is, how true is this? And uh, consider the commentary I found on one internet uh, marketing site, okay? This is what it said. Remember that old Sprite commercial where the big, sweaty basketball player runs around and does a few slam dunks? then grabs a nice cold bottle of Sprite and proudly proclaims the obviously scripted line, image is nothing, thirst is everything, obey your thirst. Well, I'm going to come out right now and say that Sprite is full of crap. (laughs) Thirst is nothing and image is everything. No matter how thirsty you are to accomplish your goals, no matter how hard you try, and no matter what you do to succeed in the online world, you will be spinning your wheels in futile efforts unless you portray the right image. Ouch. Right. So all these years later, the question before us, you know, are we as a society, as, are, are we as a people more image conscious or less? And does it even matter? So if you're just joining us at Access, we've been in a, a series called Our Digital Life. And so we're in week three And this is a series that's exploring the impact of our smartphones and social media on our lives. Okay. (laughs) Uh, And last week, we considered the implications of Facebook on our friendships, on how that shapes our sense of belonging. And we saw that Jesus models for us this vulnerable uh, authenticity, this vulnerable connection with his disciples. And he, he freely expressed his emotional depths with his closest friends. And that provides a model for us as we think about our friendships and relationships. Today, we're going to look at the popular app Instagram and consider its role in shaping our image consciousness. Now, I would argue that as a species, we have been image conscious from, from almost the very beginning. From the beginning when humanity broke fellowship with God, we have been image conscious. And so if you look at the story in the, of Adam and Eve, you see that after they ate of the tree, it says that their eyes were open and suddenly they realized that they were naked. And what happened when they made that realization? All of a sudden they were ashamed. They became insecure, and so they took fig leaves to cover themselves. And I would suggest that was the beginning of their image consciousness. And then we see in the Tower of Babel that these people built a, a monument to what? To make a name for themselves. They were trying to build a reputation to gain acclaim and applause in the world, and that is just another form 
of image consciousness. And then years later, we see King Saul. Uh, he, he gets angry. He gets jealous. He, he becomes threatened by this shepherd boy named David who slays the giant Goliath. Because people start to praise David. As his star rises, Saul feels threatened. He sees his star rising. He becomes image conscious. And so technologies like Instagram and Facebook and whatever it might be, uh, they've simply provided a very a highly efficient platform that taps into this basic instinct. And what they've done is they've taken that natural uh, proclivity to be concerned with image and they've placed it in front of us 24-7. And I think that process, that reality has augmented our sense of image consciousness as a people. So as of May 2019, uh, Instagram has about a billion registered users. Now, it asks us, I'm not sure whether we tip more towards Facebook or Instagram. That would be an interesting thing. Uh, But like Facebook, Instagram's footprint in the global world is just huge. It is the number two most engaged network. Facebook is number one. And, uh, you know, for those of you who don't use Instagram, uh, its platform focuses focuses on photos, right? Really, really nice-looking photos. And so whereas Facebook posts can often include people's thoughts or reflections, uh, articles they want to share, right, different resources and things like that, Instagram takes the pictures worth a thousand words approach. So, you know, here are just some examples I was able to call very quickly, right? So we see these beautiful pictures of food, right? Uh, on the top right, you guys, you know, this is like, this is a picture of someone just having this perfect adventurous moment. Uh, and then on the bottom right, I've never had a date like that, you know, <laughs> like never. But here they are. This couple is just, you know, <laughs> hot air balloons in the background. I mean, I like his uh, bandana, right? Um, so <laughs> we see these things, right? And they're just beautiful, right? And That's part of the reason I am actually personally not on Instagram. Uh, My wife is. I know others of you guys are. Uh, I am not because I'm terrible at taking photos. I'm, like, really bad at taking photos. Um, But if you look through people's photos, you'll often notice, like, a hashtag that accompanies it. And and it's the hashtag this, hashtag no filter. And what that means is that the photo in question was taken without the use of additional technology to edit the photo in question. I'm sure some of those were edited, okay? So I'm just sharing this, the hashtag no filter. And what does that mean? Why, do we, why would people say, oh, no filter? Because the idea is I want to communicate to you in a level of authenticity, that this is, this is just a picture I took in my real life, and it was unedited. This is what my life looks like. But in reality, if you think about it, right, everything we post is edited to some degree or fashion because we don't post every photo that we take, thank God, right? We choose what we post and what we don't post because ultimately when we're posting something, we are trying to, whether consciously or subconsciously, tell a story, right? That's why I rarely, I rarely see people post pictures of their visit to the gas station (laughs) or to H-E-B or like taking a picture of their eight-count nugget meal at Chick-fil-A. I don't see those pictures because who, like, I don't know many people who are trying to say to the world, hey, look at my basic life, <laughs> right? Rather, you know, we post pictures of our travels, of, of the things we eat, because by doing that, by posting the far-off places that we go, we communicate a different story. That, Like, oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm adventurous. I'm an explorer. I'm global-minded. I'm in touch. I'm cultured. These are also all the things that we try to communicate. Now, I wanted to say really clearly, uh, there is nothing wrong or evil in portraying an image. I think we all do it to some certain extent. But this series is about inviting reflection, right? We're inviting, inviting some critical thinking about the things that we've just grown really accustomed to as part of our lives. So, um, yeah, my wife, Grace and I were talking this morning, and she's like, well, how, are you, how will you share it in a way that like, doesn't sound preachy? And like, so I, want to, I don't want to sound preachy, but I do want to challenge us 
to think more critically about this, this aspect uh, of our lives that often goes on critically thought about, right? So here are some, some issues that I was able to think, uh, I was thinking about um, with this emphasis on image co- consciousness and image curation. So the images on Instagram and Facebook and whatever else, they're all snapshots of a particular moment in time, right? They're snapshots of a particular moment in time. And because of this, they lack two really important things. They lack context and they lack direction. So when we take a snapshot of a moment, that photo directs our attention and focus on a particular aspect of our lives. And there's a lot that is left out, a lot of the details surrounding the photo. And oftentimes, it's these details that are a lot less glamorous than what that snapshot would suggest. So, for example, right, here's this picture of this, you know, lovely couple just kind of hanging out on a road with their motorbike, their helmets nicely lined up, right? I mean, yeah, it's very romantic. It's very idyllic. It's, you know, they're kind of hip. I know they're wearing some cool things there, right? But here's the context, right? <laughs> the photographer got to lay it on on this dirt road with trash on the side, right? And it's, when you see the full picture, you're like, yeah, it's not quite as I would have imagined. Um, this doesn't relate to a picture per se, but in high school, uh, when I graduated from uh, high school, I put on my uh, college applications that I was the concert master of the Cleveland Music School Settlement Orchestra. Uh, and I was like, you know, that kind of looks good. That sounds good to be the concert master. Uh, but what that statement would not tell you is that the second chair, by, like the second chair, right? So it's concert master and the second chair. The second chair was a fourth grader. <laughs> The second chair was this petite Asian girl who was a fourth grader, okay? I didn't write that down. I didn't say, hey, but just a qualifier. This doesn't look as good as it may sound, right? But if you were to just take that snapshot, you think, wow, John's this accomplished violinist, right? Second thing is snapshots lack direction, right? And what I mean by direction is they lack movement. They are points in time, and so they're unable to show all the moments that lead up to that point in time and all the moments that come after. And so instead, what they do is they freeze one moment in time. And what that means is the snapshots lead to a false sense of permanence, as if, you know, like what that person's life or as if like, uh, uh, yeah, my life or whoever's life that you see on Instagram is like just one giant smile, one giant day at the beach, one giant adventure. But what we don't see is all the stuff that leads up to it and all the stuff that comes after it. So, for example, I shared with you all um, that, you know, my family, we went to uh, Hawaii, and we had this, incre- for the first time, we had this incredible time there, and we took a family photo on the beach. The sunset was setting. Uh, we were all wearing our Aloha shirts, right, and we were, like, all smiling. It was, I mean, it's a beautiful picture. It was really a beautiful picture. But what you wouldn't know about that picture is leading up to it, I was super annoyed. I was like really mad because Noah almost peed himself and I was running around trying to find a bathroom. Uh, Luke was just whining and complaining. And so when Grace is like, it's time for the photo, I'm like, what? But I knew it meant a lot to her. So I just, I put on the, you know, I put on the smile, right? But you wouldn't know that. You would just look at that picture and be like, wow, beautiful family in this beautiful paradise, right? Uh, It lacks context and direction. Um, And so why is that important? Because uh, life isn't one snapshot. It's just a series, a series of moments. And you may take a person, take a snapshot of a person who maybe in that moment looks like a mess. Maybe they don't look very photogenic or good or whatever, but their life is actually trending in a positive direction. They're actually making healthier choices, seeking to grow and mature, but the photo wouldn't capture that. On the other hand, there are others that you might take a photo and it looks great, it looks beautiful, but the direction of their life is actually going towards self-destruction. They're actually making poor choices. They're on a path, uh, you know, that, that, is, that is betrayed by the photo. So last year, uh, there is a very, very well-known and well-respected pastor uh, that I looked up to, many looked up to, that fell from grace. It came out that uh, this person had multiple sexual indiscretions. Uh, and just whole life was just heading towards uh, hubris, 
lack of accountability, uh, and just moral collapse, right? I mean, really sad. And yet, if you were just to look at the snapshots of this person's life, you would think, man, they're so influential, they're so godly, they're leaving this incredible legacy, right? But without being able to see the movement of their life, all I was, you know, I, just, I was just able to see the things that were posted online or for public consumption. A third issue is that the constant barrage of photos makes it incredibly hard not to compare. So in the past, right, think about this, you might see that like perfect body, the perfect home, the perfect vacation, whatever it might be, like in the grocery aisle as you were checking out, right, on these really nice glossy magazine covers. And now those same photos are in our hands all the time constantly vying for our attention, constantly reminding us of how flabby our abs are or how mundane our life is or how, you know, boring and pedestrian our food is, right? Or, uh, you know, just how lame our social life is, right? So we're constantly reminded because we have, we have all, every time we scroll, just like, oh, my life's not like that. I don't look like that. I don't have that. I don't do that. And so it's that comparison trap is a major, major issue. But perhaps the most fundamental issue with image curation is that it lulls us into putting our energies, uh, our time, our finances, our thought life onto building the shiny exterior, right, to the detriment of building the interior, right? We don't have unlimited resources. We don't have unlimited time and energy. And so if we are putting all our thought life into capturing the perfect moment or saying the most pithy thing or whatever it might be, in reality, that that is just a time and energy that we could be investing elsewhere, okay? So that these are some some of the things that we need to be aware of that are dynamics, I believe, of this whole social media oriented time that we live in. We need reminders, we need practices that keep us, uh, keep us freer from this vortex of image consciousness. And this is where the words and teachings of Jesus are so incredible. You know, even though he says these things 2,000 years ago, I am amazed that they still have so much resonance for our time today. And so I'd like us to look at one passage where Jesus directly confronts the human preoccupation with image consciousness. Let's look at what he says in Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received the reward in full. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And so this teaching is organized around three important religious practices that were common in first century Jewish life. They remain common today. The first practice is giving to the needy, giving to the poor, prayer, and fasting. And in each instance, what Jesus does, he warns them of doing these seemingly good things for the wrong reason, in order to be seen. 
And so there's variations in each verse. It's the same idea, right? He says, don't do it to be, they do it to be seen, to be honored, to be seen, to show others. And all of these are kind of just, they're expressions of that same basic drive that we've been talking about, the desire to build an image. And you'll notice that as I was reading it, each time Jesus warns them against doing things to be seen, he tells them not to be like the who, which group? The hypocrites. Now, that's definitely a pejorative term today, but its origin is telling. The word hypocrites comes from the Greek word that means what? Actor. From the Greek word meaning actor. And so actors, of course, were someone who played the part of someone else. They are someone who is one thing, but they're trying to portray a different image to the audience. And so Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites who do these religious deeds, not out of love for God, but to portray an image. And the irony of all this is that these activities themselves are actually good things. You know, they're meant to draw us closer to God. They help other people who are in need. But isn't it so interesting that we can take even the best thing, we can take good things, and we can twist it. We can twist it to serve a baser purpose to make it about us. And so Jesus counsels them. He says, yeah, you, you know these practices of giving, of fasting, and prayer. Well, let me give you a fourth practice, the practice of secrecy. Now think about this. In, in the church, or if you, think, you, know, if you grew up in the church, you know, you've, we've all heard about like, you know, the kind of the regular practices, right? Like reading your Bible, praying, serving, worship. How many of you guys have heard of secrecy? Uh, secrecy is pretty straightforward, yet extremely, extremely counter-cultural. So in secrecy, we are addressing head-on the temptation that you and I feel to do what we are doing for any audience besides God. In secrecy, we are resisting, we are, we are actively resisting our ego's hunger, our ego's hunger for validation, recognition, and affirmation. By doing things in secret, we become aware of the desire of that temptation to let others know about it. By doing things in secret, we are training our gaze and our focus on God. So Renovari puts it this way. All right, yeah, the back to secrecy. All right, Renovari puts it this way. A secrecy is consciously refraining from having our good deeds and qualities generally known, which in turn rightly disciplines our longing for recognition. As Psalm 51.6 51, says, You desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. So at its core... Image consciousness, this preoccupation with image, is really a heart issue. The temptation of being seen is rooted in a very real and basic human need. The need to know that we have significance. The need to feel validated. validated to know that we do matter. These are very real needs. And so the desire to be seen is a real need but it is misplaced. It is a real need, but it is misplaced. Because it gives to other people the power and the privilege of being able to speak into our core identity. And that power, that privilege, is reserved for God. The only one who can see us and know us completely. The only one who can make an accurate judgment of who we are. And so Jesus' counsel in this is basically seek to know in the secret place, seek to know what God thinks of you. Hear what he has to say to you. And I would suggest that the grip of image consciousness, and the time and energy that we place into image curation, these things, this vice-like grip can only be loosened as we come to grips with who we truly are as we come to grips with our true identity. And in the stillness of privacy, away from people's looking eyes or applause or likes or affirmation, 
we are able to hear the still small voice of God say, you are my beloved child. You are my beloved child. Despite your sin, despite your brokenness, I see it all and you are my beloved child. In you, I am well pleased. In you, I am well pleased. In the stillness of the secret places, we hear God dismantle what Henry Nouwen says are the five lies of identity. That I am what I have, that I am what I do, I am what other people say or think of me, I am nothing more than my worst moment, and I am nothing less than my best moment. And can you see how our image conscious world, it just reinforces, right, with so much force, so much power, these lies. And what secrecy does is it pushes back. It pushes back against these lies of our identity. And so let me reiterate, okay, I'm not saying that social media is bad or we should just, you know, we should get rid of our Instagram accounts. I'm not saying that. That may, that may be what God is whispering to you. And if that is, then hear that. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to be really careful, really vigilant about how we engage about in these things because they do shape us. They are shaping me. They are shaping you. They are shaping our community, and they are shaping our world. So here are just some, some suggestions that we could take with us to kind of... Uh, Take these ideas and begin to live into them. First, I'd like to suggest that we each find out what helps to remind you of who you truly are, right? So when our sense of identity is solid, when we know who we belong to, who, our, our, our worth, yeah, we, we're freed. We're, we become freer from this preoccupation with image. And so let me ask you, who are the friends, who are the close friends that can speak truth to you and say, hey, I love you just where you are. You don't have to prove anything to me. Who are those people that you need to be around? And what are the practices that you find helpful that help you reorient your sense of identity? So for me, it's, there's this prayer I just pray every day that just kind of reminds me, what are the truest things about how God sees me? Right? For you, it might be journaling. Uh, for you, it might be reading scripture that reminds you of core truths. Maybe it's listening to worship music that kind of takes your mind off of the world and onto God, right? So find the practices that remind you of your truest identity. I think a second thing is purposely and intentionally extract yourself from the comparison trap. I know during Lent, it's often very, uh, a lot of people will say like, all right, for Lent, I am going to get off of Facebook for the next 40 days or so. I think that's a great practice. Uh, but maybe we don't need to just wait till Lent. Maybe we can schedule a day where like once a week I'm going to, you know, just kind of extract myself from uh, the whole social media thing so I can just focus on recalibrating. That would be a very healthy thing, all right? So finding some balance there. I want to suggest that we also deliberately invest, <coughs> excuse me, that we deliberately invest on building our inside, right? Uh, so much of our world, right, if we're caught in that comparison trap, we're just spending all our time curating our image. But if we get quiet, hey, this is what I'm really about. Now, how can I invest in the things that truly matter, what's on the inside? And so that might look like signing up for a faith walking formation group, uh, that might look like taking advantage of one of Pastor David's soul care retreat, but scheduling some time in your month or your year where you're, you're investing. You're investing in the places that are unseen and that, that truly matter. And then at a really practical level, right? As you and I post stuff online, right? Um, before you post, just take a brief pause. Take a brief pause to just kind of get aware of your motivation. What's driving me right now in this moment, in this second where I want to post this or say this thing, right? And um, what I think most of us will find is that it's a combination. It's a mixture of good intentions, innocuous intentions, as well as some more subversive ones. And I think the first step is just to acknowledge that. And you don't have to beat yourself over the head over it. Like, just acknowledge it. Yeah, this is where I'm at today, right? And you just kind of admit that to yourself and admit that to God, right? 
And just that process of self-awareness begins to free us from that cycle. Uh, The last thing I want to say is to try to be okay with just savoring some of the moments of our lives without needing to show others that moment, right? Can we learn to just, hey, I'm just going to be present. I'm going to put my phone away. I'm having an awesome time. This food is delicious. This beach is amazing, but I don't, I don't need to take a picture of it. I'm just going to enjoy it with God. I'm going to savor this moment. Thank God for this gift. I'm going to enjoy it with the people around me. And that's, that's good enough, right? So uh, maybe we can begin to try to do that more often. So image is nothing, thirst is everything. That's kind of a great slogan for a beverage, but not very helpful for our spiritual lives, is it? And so there's another motto that I want to leave with that I think is, I, I really love. And it's from the Latin, this, esse quam videri, to be rather than to seem, right? Let's be a people that lives this out, to be, to be deep people, to be substantial people, to be people who's who are being transformed from the inside out into God's image. Let's focus on being rather than seeing. And man, that's exciting, because if we do that, right, if we start to live into who we truly are, and we become freed from this kind of preoccupation with image, just imagine the things that we're able to, to live into, that we're able to do, because we're not worried about curating the image. We're living into our God-given identity, calling, and mission. Let's pray together. Just in this, yeah, I'd like to give us just a moment of pause. What does God want you to know about your truest identity, about who you are? Ask God that question. God, what do you want me to know about my image? how you see me. Lord, I thank you for our time this morning. I thank you for your words spoken to the disciples, um, teaching them about their truest self. And God, uh, we confess that we just, we live in a world that we're just being bombarded constantly with images of what we should be, what we should look like, what our lives uh, ought to have. Um, And it's hard. Man, God, it is hard, it is hard not to fall into that. So God, I pray that you would help all of us, myself included, to to be more free from this grip uh, and to begin to live out of our truest identity, that we are beloved children of our creator God through Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that if there are people here who did not yet know that truth for themselves, that they might sense you nudging on the door of their hearts and you might welcome them in, that they might say yes to you. God, help us to know what you would have us know. I pray this in your name. Amen. I've put some questions here for us to think about. Um, So just take a minute to look at these questions, uh, right? Where do you notice yourself comparing to other people? Um, you know, are there specific facets of your life that you tend to uh, be kind of lulled into comparisons? Um, what does God, uh, what helps you to be reminded of who you truly are, right? What are the pathways? Who are the people that you need to be surrounded with that will remind you of who you truly are? And a counterpoint to what we've been talking when do you think it is important to care about one's image, right? Because Yeah, it's not like you can just ditch that completely, right? When is it important? And it's finally just open-ended. What does God want you to know about your image? So could we just take a few minutes, the person sitting next to you, maybe groups of two, three, uh, just to, what are your initial thoughts as you're 
wrestling with these concepts and these ideas, all right? Uh, you don't have to share if you, would, you, you don't want to, but we just want to create some space to kind of interact with what we're talking about. So to go ahead, take a few minutes um, to share with the person sitting next to you or a few people sitting around next to you.